Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us. I'm honored to introduce our guest, Arnold Yassinmol. He's a PhD candidate at Leiden University in Religious Aesthetics and Islamic Intellectual History, where he researches on authoring and ethics in Islamic exegetical history with a special focus on the Ottoman Tafsir tradition. He's a research assistant at the Institute for the Revival of Traditional Islamic Sciences, where he studies the traditional Islamic curriculum. He is a fellow at, at the Yabin Institute for Islamic Research and at the British Board of Scholars and Imams. He is also a research consultant on religion and theology of care at a Dutch health care NGO and a spiritual care worker in a detention, detention and health care setting. His previous publications include Islamic Human Rights Discourse and Hermeneutics of Continuity in Journal of Islamic Ethics, Divine Respite in the Ottoman Tafsiri Tradition, in Usman Lida, Ilmi Tafsir, and Layla Tulta as Sacred Time in Islamic Studies Today, essays in honor of Andrew Rippin. Thank you very much, Arnold, for joining us. And please start your presentation and firstly tell us about your journey in Tafsir studies. Um, it first started, um, yeah, as uh, as a confessional uh, person myself. Uh, I'm a, uh, I converted to Islam almost 20 years ago, and I converted because I was uh, interested. Uh, I came across the Quran and I became interested in it. So the Quran has always been a main concern to me. And of course, I got to know the Quran through a Dutch translation. And uh, so the idea of meaning and how meaning is uh, developed and uh, attained is something that always interested me. So when I eventually started to uh, do my Islamic studies at uh, my undergrad studies at Leiden University, uh, I immediately focused on uh, tafsir studies uh, as a way to understand uh, how a tradition uh, develops hermeneutics, how in a sense, what the, what, in what way does it really delve the Quranic meaning, the, the, the textual meaning, in what way does it, how much does a tradition and a, a, a confessional community, how much does it allow the text to say? And what does, it, what does it not allow the text to say? So for me, that was fascinating in a sense. What is the possible scope of meaning uh, um, that can be generated from, from such a text, from a core source text of a confessional community? And, uh, and of what also interests me, before that I've studied Christian theology, biblical studies, and when you look at uh, hermeneutical communities, exegetical communities, Tafsir really sticks out. So when it comes to the major religions in the world, the way the Islamic community has created uh, a hermeneutical discipline around the Quran is in a lot of ways very unique. Um, there's almost not something similar in other traditions. Um, uh, in the way also how it separates a lot of these approaches to the text. So, uh, for example, uh, a lot of the way how rabbinic commentaries developed uh, on, the, uh, on the Old Testament, on the Torah, um, is more a bit also how, in a sense, it does look uh, in some ways a bit of tafsir, but it also it co incorporates, of course, a lot of uh, what we would, in Islam, would we call fiqh, so the Islamic jurisprudence. So the way how the, in, within the Islamic tradition, how tafsir as an hermeneutical uh, uh, genre developed as a sort of overarching science where it tries to, in a sense, incorporate all these different types of approaches towards elements of Islamic expressions, all the other sciences and approaches from theology to philosophy to jurisprudence, uh, mysticism, in the way it does it, and also that it sees the whole Quran as subject to that so that the whole quran can be approached from these different viewpoints um, or that in a sense that all these sciences can can in a sense have a place within the hermeneutical understanding of the quran and yeah, that's something really unique within uh, the history of religions mm -hmm. so for me that was also uh, fascinating in a sense that you not know, that for me as from a personal perspective, I was interested in a sense, what does the Islamic tradition allow the Quran to be? But also then, of course, it struck me that the, that the Tafsir tradition by itself is already unique. So you have this double uniqueness that is going on. 
Mm -hmm. And um, and my second concern is mainly revolves around the way how theology and ethics uh, uh, align themselves. So the way the uh, the concept of God is constructed, the way in a sense theology, the the construct of theology, and then also the construct of the humans, how theology and anthropology, how they coincide and in a sense create this ethical scope as well. Uh, was for me fascinating and then how that ethical scope is in a sense um, yeah has a place within this hermeneutical tradition so I always in a sense switch between the uh, my ethical concern and my hermeneutical concern I try to in a sense always try to see how they align and again the Tafsir tradition um, helps a lot in that because it is this overarching science over all the other different Islamic sciences so in a lot of ways you can delve from the Tafsir tradition all these different types of ethical expressions that are also present within other genres. Um, so yeah, that's one of the things that uh, that fascinated me most. So for example, I'm not really concerned with grammatical Tafsir and you know, I'm not really a linguist, so I'm not really concerned in that. For me, it's mostly about a, a sort of theological anthropology and how that is expressed within an hermeneutical tradition. Okay, thank you very much. That was fascinating. Um, so you, you're going to talk about thick comparative tafsir studies. What is this thick tafsir studies? What do you mean by that? There's something that, um, in a sense, it came about when you and I were discussing what we're going to do with this talk. Because originally I just, uh, you know, because like also Johanna said uh, in her contact, like, let's don't make it, yeah, if you want to, you can make it something really big, unique, whatever. But uh, you know, if you want to just present something you're doing, in a sense, the, uh, see it more as a sort of conversation, table talk. So I was like, okay, I'm going to keep it simple. First, I wanted to br bring in a whole new type of subject. Uh, but then when this came about, that let's do a webinar, I was like, okay, I'm going to keep it simple. Um, because I've been working for several years on comparative tafsir, focused on several Quran verses. Uh, that that naturally came about suddenly in a sense I noticed a certain type of uh, type of exegesis on a certain Quran verse and in the end I ended up looking at how more than 70 different tafsir works looked at that Quran verse and I started to plot that out to sort of map that out in a sort of genealogy and I remember I was sitting with uh, Omar Anchasi uh, uh, I think he's now at Exeter or uh, no, he's at Edinburgh, uh, uh, the University of Edinburgh. He came to visit me here in Holland and he was sitting on my couch and I was showing him in a sense I, what I was doing. And I felt it was a bit like, yeah, I'm still not really sure what I'm doing, but anyway, this is it. And he said, you looked at so, so many tafsir texts uh, at, for this one Quran verse. And like, yeah, he says, you do know that it means in a sense that, uh, that you, in a sense that, um, now you created a sort of tef comparative tafsir that in a sense you don't see anywhere else. And then I started to think about it in a sense, yeah, what did I do? And what does it help to look at, you know, 50 plus works? What does that even do? You know, now one of the things that I noticed uh, uh, is that although, of course, you get a lot of repetition, of course, that repetition says a lot about the tafsir tradition. Um, at the same time, when people um, deviate from a sort of uh, copy-paste approach that is also interesting. What does that say about the author? Uh, what does it say about the av availability of, of certain texts? Um, uh, you know, did the person ignore certain core texts because it was not available to them? So you need to check that at other Quran verses. Maybe you can see if those core texts were used at other verses. So is ignoring certain cortex deliberate or is it something that evolved naturally or yeah it's it, it you know or is it in a sense really like a personal project because you see that a lot with a lot of tafsir works you can see in some of them behind me you know how do you write this you know how do you write a 20 volume work how long does that take so there's a lot of biography involved mm -hmm. you know i remember that joseph lombard said it uh, uh, said at one time that of course, like he said, when he was working on the study Quran, he said, you have kids walking about, people, in a sense, barging in, normal life intrudes on your work. So it's like, okay, so there's a lot of personal things within, uh, within such a text. So 
for me, that started to think about how do we look at tafsir text and what, you know, um, a lot of the works I, uh, when I started to delve into tafsir studies, you have the standard works, you know, they're still standard works. Of course, you have Goldziers work, you know, it's, uh, uh, about the Richting, the uh, Richting, this is Islam, Quranic uh, exegese. Uh, you have uh, Jane uh, Markley's work, Quranic Christians, and you have a lot of these works. And when I looked at them, a lot of them, for example, only look at like 10 plus tafsir works, sometimes even only five. But it's, let's say in general, you can see they look at 10, 10 tafsir works. And I started to notice that, um, in a sense, that does it really provide us a vision of what the tafsir tradition is? Because when I started to, when I started to look at the 70 plus works, a lot of times I was surprised what people were doing. Mm -hmm. And um, so there, in a sense, a lot of the typologies, if you, uh, a lot of the typology we generated are still make sense, but they're not meaningless. But a lot of times we, in a sense, we force a lot of text to, we expect them to work from a certain typology, a certain category. Uh, but of course, that doesn't always work, especially with the larger works. Like, for example, Ibn, ha Ibn, Haba, Ibn Adil al hambali mm. he has an encyclopedic approach, so he discusses everything. Uh, a lot of the smaller works still combine a lot of typologies at one Quran verse. What so it, so what, that, does that, that way, what does that say? Hmm? You think that the way that right now the, the, the leaders, are, I mean, the leading scholars focusing on tafsir, that they focus on a particular number of works, is because of we, each of them follow the footstep of the earlier generation, right? You mean that we should open up yeah. space for other tafsirs? Yeah, so we also follow core texts. We also, so like, like the tafsir tradition has core texts and a sort, of a sort of idea of how genealogy works of authorities, we have the same thing as well. And you can see that, how, you can see that in the Arab world, in the Islamic world, how they view, how they view the tafsir uh, tradition. And the same thing you see, of course, in Western and academic studies of tafsir tradition. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, what, and the thing is that I was thinking about is that, especially when I started to do large comparative tafsir works, uh, uh, that I noticed in a sense, yeah, the typologies, of course, that are generated, that in a sense, the typologies that are applied at a Quran verse, of course, has a lot to do with the author. Um, he has a certain idea of what is good Islamic science, what is good hermeneutics. But at the same time, a lot of times, he still has a sort of scope. A lot of them have a certain scope that they feel is allowed to apply on the text. And so then the text, uh, in a sense, is the determiner of the typologies that are allowed to be applied on that text as well. So you have, in a sense, two, uh, two uh, hinges that, that um, uh, that determine what type of topologies are allowed, the author itself, but also uh, the, 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 the source text you're looking at, that Quran verse or that surah, that chapter, that Quranic chapter. So I started to think about, if you look at religious studies, of course, we have this Geertian idea of fin studies, the, the fin description, the fit description. So I started to think a bit out, uh, about that, of how I could use that to define two different approaches of seer studies without saying one is good and the other is bad they have different functions so for example a fin description simply in the sense for the majority allows uh, uh, um, a sort of allows the, the existing typologies and the categories that are mainly sound to be applied top down on the text we're looking at so of course when i read ibn kathir i expect a certain scope you know, I know him a bit, we all know him a bit, so we don't expect a lot of surprises. Uh, but there are a lot of others, especially because now we have this immense output of tafsir texts that are published. A lot of times even that the authors, for example, are unknown. With Ibn Adil Hanbali, for example, we don't know a lot about him. We, he, has, he has written one small commentary on a Hanbali Usul text, and that's it. And then he wrote this tafsir. So like, you know, that is his output. So for the rest, we don't know a lot about him, except that he's Hanbali. When you look at his tafsir text, he, in a sense, he uses both uh, Afari, Zahari, and Ashari interpretations without, with ease. So what is, what is he? 
So a lot of times you cannot stick a typology uh, on the offer itself. So then you can, you, so you cannot use a sort of top-down expectation of typologies on a certain text. So then it has to come out of the text itself. So you mean so we need bottom up? Exactly. So so, so how is it bottom up? Now with the bottom up, is, yeah, I can. Uh, uh, should I? Uh, yes, please. Uh, I think it's a good idea to share your PowerPoint slides. Yeah, I made a small PowerPoint. I know we cannot, uh, sh you know, look at everything, but mm -hmm. in, uh, in a sense, I wanted to. Uh, let's see if um, if it can help the discussion a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, let me share the screen. Um, okay, that's. Um, how does that work on this? I used it on the iPad. I don't know. I'm not used to how it sounds like this. Okay. Um, share. Share a screen and then you can see a few windows and you just click on your PowerPoint. Open the PowerPoint first. Okay. Yeah. System preferences. The first time I use Zoom on the, on this this uh, no problem. device. Uh, <clears throat> uh, yeah. Okay. Got it. Okay. You see it? Yeah. Very good. Okay. Perfect. Um. Okay. Uh, I have to navigate a bit. Okay. Um, so this is something, of course, that, for example, Walid Saleh has pointed out several times, the idea of Tafsir studies as a sort of ideological studies. Mm -hmm. So, and the, so I have a, I have some questions here that I don't have, still have answers to. You know, that's something I'm thinking about. Maybe also, of course, I hope that a lot of people can also think about this, and maybe some people already have some good answers on this. But in a sense, I start. I want to, in a sense, deconstruct the Tafsir studies both from the traditional point of view, the the Islamic world point of view, the uh, uh, historical critical approach in uh, in in contemporary academic studies. So I mean, Tafsir studies in the broad sense. Uh, um, and so I was thinking about it as, okay, Tafsir studies as ideological studies. So what are our criteria for satisfying comparisons? When is a sort of thin approach, a top-down approach, when is that enough to make your claims? When, is, when does a thick approach is useful, is even maybe needed? I don't have any answer to that now because uh, when I started to do my research on the Quran versus I did a thick approach on my idea of a thick approach, uh, when I was finished and I showed it to people, they in a sense said, "You are you can say a lot of things with this, but at the same, but what was the central question you wanted to get answered?" And I was like, "Yeah, I didn't have it; it just evolved a bit." So there's still so, a lot of ways that I need to think about when is a thin approach uh, would be satisfying, and when is a thicker approach needed and satisfying. And of course, yeah, which tradition or who defines our premises, the categories, the typologies? So. Uh, my full life, formative, you know, I remember that I started, I had to create this formatting of what is the time period I'm working in. And of course, yeah, you have like four different ways to define them. We still don't have like a good consensus, even in Tafsir studies on that. So that, that is something I came across. So who defines it? How do you, uh, how do you negotiate that within Tafsir studies? When do premises, categories, typology become meaningless. And I, like I said, I see a lot now that we get a lot of text published where the author is unknown or we don't have a lot of information about that person. So uh, how, then we, how are we going to use the existing typologies and categories? And, do, and, and in what way also does it, does it, do they become obstacles? Do we miss certain things they want to say? You know, maybe in a sense, it, maybe a text introduces or presents us with new type of ways of categories and typologies, but we miss it because we apply a top-down approach to the text. Mm -hmm. um, also, of course, I was thinking about, there's a, there's a lot of new technology, OCR, the Kitab project, but also a lot of apps and websites. You now have, for example, an app uh, 
um, which uh, it's a very good app. Of course, you already had Shamila and stuff like that, but for example, you also have Al Bahaf Al Quraniya. Uh, uh, there, of course, and also, of course, the Alba, the Al uh, uh Institute that they create a lot of websites and uh, apps for on smart devices, where you can just type in a Quran verse, and then you see uh, all the tafsir, all the exegetes that ever wrote a tafsir on the Quran verse. In a sense, you see it in a list. So suddenly, you can do a fit a comparison of fifty works on one screen. You know, that is something, of course, that a lot of people that defined the tafsir tradition, doesn't matter from which tafsir, tafsir tradition, nobody ever had the access to tafsir works as we have now. Right. So what would that mean? You know, so what, what is the possibility for a fit comparative tafsir study? Arnold, I think, I think what, what you say is tell us, at least tell me that, uh, given the recent technology and you know, the website, different types of tafsir, digital tafsir, and so on, probably we should expect the new types of tafsir studies at least, because we have access to better or more detailed commentaries on the Quran, and on the other hand, probably it's going to change the, you know, our care and the studies on tafsir, the movement going to change the track, you know, focusing on wider perspective, you know, have a better idea about different commentaries, unknown commentaries take into account, am I right? In a sense, um, are, do we allow to be, in a sense, uh, do we have like an open approach to, to framing the way we frame at the moment? So in what way does our, our expectations within, the, uh, as, as, at least mine, that's the thing I was thinking about in a sense. Because of course, when I started to learn about the Sears studies, of course, I expected, uh, uh, um, uh, not to give an example, uh, okay, so I started, for example, when I uh, I started to gather all the different typologies, both from the traditional sources, mm -hmm. from the within the Islamic tradition, and from the uh, uh, contemporary academic studies. So then you get this sort of cluster of typologies, and then you know I, when I made this figure, I was very happy, like okay, I think I got them all. And then I started to look at them. I'm like, they in a sense they become meaningless in a sense because it's so much. So Okay, I have them gathered now, and of course, I'm not saying that this is a, a good framing, but I was like, okay, what does this say then, you know, okay, what can I do with this? So, um, I also felt that in a sense that, yeah, all these typologies, these categories in a sense, although of course they help, you can use them to, they are sort of to identify ingredients of text, but, uh, um, yeah, in what way do they become obstacles? They uh, become closed systems of how we look at text. How much biography do we need to know uh, of a certain author to, in a sense, to, to pick them? So if, you, if you're gonna do a Finn comparison, so you have to cho you're gonna choose 10, 10 different works or 15 works, how do you choose them? Do you do, you do that by um, by era, you know, by formative period, uh, post-classical, early modern, etc. Do you do that by Sunni Shia? Do you do, uh, 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 do you do that by Mafur and Rai? So in a sense, how do you choose an offer? With a thick approach, in a sense, what, what was my idea? You just pick up a work. And you just, you got, of course, you got to look at who's the offer, in what era does he fit, but that's it then. So you didn't choose the offer based on certain expectations, you simply chose the text because the text is available and you just put it into the data. You know, so that's a very different, so that's a very, very different way between the, in a sense, a sort of thick and thin approach. Um, so I, this in a sense, what I was thinking about thin comparison, thick comparison, like I said, I don't have, I haven't worked it out yet, but okay, so, with Finn, you look at like one or 10 works, maybe 15 works, how do you choose them? And of course, then you already have to have like a top down idea of, I want to, you know, I want this meal, I want these ingredients. So you already know what to expect. This is sweet, this is salt, this is pepper. You know, with a thick approach, it's very different. You just in a sense, grab what you have. And especially with the new technology that's coming up. When I started to do work on certain research papers where I started to compare more than 70 works, 
I bought a lot of books because they were not available in PDF. And otherwise they were available in PDF or they were available in Shamala. So I, in a sense, I started to look for them everywhere. What is available to me? And then I had to, in a sense, draw a line. So for example, I didn't incorporate uh, manuscripts. I, I, I also had to draw a line. Okay, I'm only going to use works that were central or accepted within the Sunni tafsir tradition. Because I was already at 70 plus works. If I would, I still want to do a comparison also with the Ibadi and Shia and anything else. But again, what is my, and I want to involve manuscripts. But then where do I draw a line? When is enough enough? Is it going to be 100 works, 150 works, 200 works? Because we're going to end up in 10 years from now that this is, that, that is going to be the new normal that is that we can allow ourselves to look at 100 plus texts in one go, in one click. We can, we, we can, in a sense, we have this large menu. What, what we're going to do with that? How we're, how we're going to do sensible works? Because especially also, if you were to do a fin comparison, how can you allow yourself to do a fin comparison when you have 100 works available to you? How are you going to, because then you have to say, I'm only going to choose these 10 works. How are you going to, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, 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 be, you know, sh show how you did that and why you did that. So, so even we need to think about what is fit comparison, uh, fit comparison, but also how this going to redefine the thing comparison. You know, because a lot of the older works that uh, that in the that define uh, tafsir studies, both in the Islamic tradition and the historical critical academic tradition, a lot of these were defined by the available works. Now we're going to have an, um, an immense amount of available works. So how does how this going to redefine us? So um, yeah, that that is something I've been thinking about. So I can um, show a bit what I mean also with uh, two different things that I've written. So this is something you and I worked on. So this is something that you edited as well. So uh, I did. Think a... that you think that so far we, what we have is thick tafsir or today, these days we have any thick tafsir studies or mostly it's still thin tafsir? And, I, uh, and what you think of, do you think if, when we say thick and thin, do you think we can divide it into two parts of what is going on in the Muslim world and what is going on in Western academy? Because it's still the idea of what is Shi'i tafsir. It is very hard for them or at least in, you know, how they want to evaluate some Sunni words. Or it is, it is not really the matter of technology anymore. It's going to be related to their ideology. Once they are interested in Shiism or Shi'i tafsir, or on the other hand, Sunni, so they automatically exclude the, tafs the, the Shi'i one, or vice versa. So, yeah, I don't have an answer to that completely, but in a sense, I just want to look at, at the awareness. In the sense, I'm starting to get become more aware that uh, um, that a lot of my premises, in a sense, are becoming, in a sense, outdated with the available, with in a sense, the largeness of the buffet that is in front of me, and also especially when you start to uh, start to compare a lot of works, then suddenly it doesn't really um, 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 a lot of the a lot of the Shi works also incorporated, uh, of course, Sunni opinions. You know, partially as the other, but not always. So a lot of the pre, uh, a lot of she she works that also in that uh, that that uh, were developed uh, that were uh, written before Baidawi, is before the 13th century. A lot of them used Labi, but also Wahidi uh, uh, as a sort of secondary opinion, without saying that's the Sunni opinion. You know, also they just incorporated it. So did they incorporate did they incorporate the opinion to show the other, or is in a sense is for them it is an acceptable opinion? It's not always clear. Same thing with, for example, Al Razi. He he uses Kadi uh, Kadi uh, uh, Jabbar a lot, and but it's not always clear if he cites him, references him as the other, or as that he cites him as providing a good opinion. So when is Qadi Abdul Jabbar the other, the opponent, or when he's on your side? With Al Razi, that's not always clear. For example, uh, um, so again, also uh, you know, then and Zamakshari. Uh, a lot of times, 
he incorporates what we would call, you know, orthodox Sunni tafsir. Does he, why does he, do, why does he do that? You know, so it's because it goes against normal, a lot of the Mutezala ideas about theology, but he still incorporates it in his tafsir. What are his intentions? If you look at a lot of the super commentary works on Samar Shari, they say he did this because he wanted to attract a Sunni audience to expose them to Mutezala ideas, you know? So he was, so he was scheming. So they, they are very suspicious of, of Zamar Shari, why he incorporated a lot of the Sunni opinions in his tafsir. But I don't know if that, for example, we can take, do we take over that opinion? You know, do we, allow, do we accept that? So there are now like, for example, two main works written on, uh, uh, on Zamar Shari, one by Lane and the other by, what's her name again? I forgot her name. Um, but they give two different opinions uh, about um, one. Lane says that uh, um, that in a sense, I think it was Lane that said uh, 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 that Samarshari doesn't follow normative Mutesle principles in his tafsir. And the other book, which and they were both published almost, in, 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 they were published like a few years apart. Uh, uh, and the other. Oh, it's uh, Kaftu Allah, I think, if I remember her last name correctly. Um, uh, and she says, no. Exactly. Thank you. So, and she says, no, Zamar Shari does uh, sticks to Mutezala principles. So who is it? Who wins in this debate? You know, because in a sense, both are, you know, trying to make Zamar Shari uh, a sort of weird Mutezala or a real Mutezala. And then, of course, the question is, who cares? You know, so th these are the sort of things we come across. So, um, uh, for example, what I have here uh, on the screen now is a table I made for my chapter on uh, on Light of Qadr within this, in the Tafsir tradition. And I translated al Maturidi's uh, uh, Tafsir exegesis on uh, Surah, uh, um, uh, Surah al Qadr. And um, what I did in the end, I made a sort of comparative table. And uh, I did this for like the main elements of the Quran, of the Quran verses. And of course, I didn't provide the full translation of what people are saying, but I only incorporated their main things. So the main themes that they, uh, that they applied in their, in their exegesis on that chapter. So then in a sense, I would define this as a sort of fin approach. You know, it's not, it's not a, uh, uh, it, is, it, it is not a full spectrum of what these scholars were saying, but uh, in a sense, it, it is simply looking at this, they provide a sort of, uh, uh, it provides a scope of meaning. And I chose these authors because they represent different, what I, what I saw as different typologies. So Mukatel, of course, represented the, the pre-orthodox, uh, 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 the pre-orthodox Tafsir formation. Maturidi represented the Kalamic tradition. Samarkandi represented the Hanafi traditional opinion uh, uh, position. Mawardi uh, fits within Tafsir Bil Mafur or with the the Kaul al Salaf. Kushari is uh, is of course the the Ishari Tafsir, the mystical Tafsir, the Sufi Tafsir. Al Razi is again is the post classical Kalamic tafsir, and Abbasud Al Effendi is the early modern uh, 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 sort of Muhtasar, uh, 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 um, uh, um, abridged uh, uh, work on, in a sense, what how the, how he would define the tafsir tradition. So I see this for so the way I chose these tafsir works was already based on certain. Uh, expectations of what they would provide. I expected them to be different, for example. Uh, so this is sort of fin approach. It, it says a lot, it, it provides a lot, it, it shows how the Tafsir tradition, this is a sort of discursive tradition, it talks with one another, it, it selects, it edits, it, 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 it deletes, it chooses, and, but when I, when you look at this, okay, does it, if you look, for example, they all say the Quran. They all say, uh, in a sense, things you expect. So, is there a difference between Mukatel, Maturidi, Samarkandi, Mawardi, Razi, and Effendi? Not really. The only one who sticks out is Kusheri. 
you know that's interesting he of course really shows he has an uh sufi tafsir because of course he brings in the saints uh but for the rest you would not see any form of difference in you know their typology doesn't matter so uh, uh um so a lot of times the fin approach doesn't really provide anything you know comparing these tafsir didn't bring anything new to the table a lot of times um when i started to work on uh, a different verse i started to work on uh on surah 11 surah al uh, verse 117 your lord will not destroy the towns with or because of injustice if it if its peoples were muslim they were right doers and i started to, um, the thing was when i started to work on this uh, uh on this verse I originally was attracted to looking at the Tashir tradition, the, the Tashir tradition that revolves around this Quran verse, because Al Razi provided a fascinating Tafsir on it. So I first was drawn into looking at this Quran verse because of Al Razi. And I started to think, you know, was Razi the first one saying this? Because it felt too radical. He is doing something so radical. I was like, he, he cannot be the first one. He cannot be Columbus. He cannot be the Vikings on Newfoundland. So what is it? So I started to look uh, back, you know, pre-Razi to look at where did he get it from? And then slowly, in a sense, I was sort of drawn with, you know, into the tunnel and I couldn't stop. And then when I was done with that, so when I looked at it, everything from Razi until what is seen as the prophetic tafsir, I also looked at what happened after Al Razi, and then I started to notice that Razi presented represented sort of paradigm shift. There is a pre-Razi, but there's also a post-Razi. And uh, so I did the same thing. I just started to catalog what all these different Tafsir words were saying, and I didn't stop. So eventually, so this did evolve naturally. It wasn't my it wasn't on purpose. It was not a strategy. But in the end, I ended up with 72 works on this one Quran verse. So, I also looked at two Shi and Ibadi works, and I started to notice sort of typologies that didn't, yeah, that didn't sense I couldn't 100% define by my available categories, my available premises. Okay, so that was fascinating. So what, what are those Shi and Ibadi here? So, and, and I want to know that, how do you think they had influence on your analysis? Because the majority of them, 72 words, you say, let's say 68 mm -hmm. of them are Sunni, and four of them are. Four of them are. Okay, Sunni so the, the two Shi works were the two are, are the two tab the two Tabarsis. Uh -huh. you know, so the two Tabarsi works, and uh, because one of them is pre Samakshari and the other was post Samakshari, so I was interested in also how Samakshari mm -hmm. created this uh, uh, this switch. And the Ibadi works uh, were, I, wait, let me, uh, one was a very early work. So in a sense, it is always discussed if he represented the Khawarij or uh, uh, in a sense, the early Ibadi. And he is, let me get it here. Um, Uh, and uh, uh, so he was a ninth century, uh, 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 yeah, in a sense, he's generally seen as a Khawarij, uh, so uh, Mufasir. You, you think that their commentary had influence on your analysis or changed yes, the because the, of 68 other Sunni works? Now, the thing is, because and that was interesting, what Al Razi defines as the Mutezila reading was the original Orthodox reading. So in Razi's time, the and you can see it here on the text, I have like you have like an A, the, so the the upper arrow represents the A reading and the downward is the B reading. The A reading was the old reading that was the dominant reading in the formative period, or at least that was the literal and the it, it, in a sense, it was the hypothetical reading. It was something that was proposed, and that that eventually became the dominant reading among the Sunni Orthodox. And what was interesting is that um, 
uh, that the A reading in Razi's time becomes the Mutesela reading. You know, so you can see the switch of how uh, um, how the uh, uh, um, how a certain how later on the A reading became the other reading, while in the earlier period it was the in a sense uh, a sort of general reading that was dominant uh, um, uh, in a lot of fields. So it was present among the early the early Khawarij, the early Ibadi uh, It was present in a sense in general among the different uh, uh, Tafsir scholars. Okay. And um, and with uh, with uh, in Al Razi's time, the A reading was suddenly the other reading that represented the Mutazila reading. So that was already interesting for me in a sense that um, because a lot of times the Mutazila reading is seen as the Tawil reading, as the Kalamic reading, and in a sense the Sunni reading is not directly always seen from that perspective. But now it was switched around. The literal reading became the Mutazila reading, and the, the, the Sunni Orthodox reading was the Kalamic reading. That was the theological hermeneutic that was applied. So it was the Sunnis who applied hermeneutics, not the Mutazila in this, in this Quran verse. Thank you. So we are a bit out of time. Can you wrap it up? Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, this is, an, uh, this is a very ugly table. <laughs> But in a sense, these were the typologies I started to generate that came out of the Tafsir works themselves. So, um, Mafur, Rai, and all the other categories became useless. So, I, I need, so my categories, my, in a sense, my indicators were defined by the works themselves. And a lot of times they were defined by an author or a keyword. So, they were defined by Tabari, they were defined by Razi, by the week. Uh, the difference between Hakan and Sad, um, if Kisas and Ambiya were used or not, if an Hadith was involved or not, um, the, the grammatical, you know, the grammar readings, you know, the Kufiyun, the Basriyun, uh, Zamar Shari, mm -hmm. um, if uh, as suddenly you get, this is the Tawil of the Akhul Sunnah. So, so these were, in a sense, these were not categories that I got from, that already there, I got them from the text. So these were delved from the works. And they became the typologies to come start to make a comparison. And what I did then was I made these sort of graphs and I drew these, drew these by hand on my iPad on a certain app. And I started to, in a sense, catalog the different uh, And this was after I scanned all these Quran, all these Tafsir texts. I started to create my own typologies and then I started to see how I can use them to create uh, uh, my own typology, to read, to start to follow how certain texts become dominant and how gene genealogies evolve. Okay. So this is the pre-classical period. And then, uh, um, like I said, the, uh, you have this mix of the A reading and the B reading. And the interesting thing is what I already saw. If I have a capital letter B, it means it's, a dominant, it's the dominant reading that is presented. If I have a lowercase letter, it is, uh, in a sense, a secondary opinion provided. So you can see already that the B reading already is very popular, but the A reading as well. And there are some B, B readings, secondary B readings are proposed as sort of secondary readings. Now, this, this is then for example, and then when you look at when you look at she's like, but he takes it. So suddenly you have what later is the A3 reading, then he here has the B25 reading, and then he here's the B23 reading. And all these have different theolo theological implications. They all represent, these are three different theologies. And of course, the, the two B readings are very close to one another, but they still differ. They still represent a different form of theology. So um, I started to started to understand, okay, I need to work differently to understand how this evolved. So in the classical period, suddenly you have people saying that the B reading is the reading of the Ahl Sunnah. So suddenly you have, it becomes an identity hermeneutic. Um, you get the idea of a core reading. So suddenly you have Farah and Sajaz that become, that become the core 
uh, texts that are used in the classical period. Right. Then you get this paradigm shift in Wahidi. You see Wahidi, um, of course, in involves the A1 reading. It's not the Mutezila reading. He says it is the, it is the, you know, the language. So the people, you know, the, the scholars of language say that this is the meaning of that Quran verse. And yeah. then he provides his own B reading as a sort of, then he says, this is the Tawil of the Akhul Sunnah. This is the Kaul Akhul Sunnah. This is the reading of the Sunni Orthodox. And that becomes huge. So the B reading becomes, becomes expanded and becomes dominant. Thank you. So you see the same thing with Samak Shari. Um, I'm going to wrap it up. Arnold, so if you look at, yeah. So I think you actually and nicely, I think, explored this area. And we, we got, a bit, we got a, your idea about the thick and thin commentaries because this is fan, fantastic and fascinating, but because we, we are a bit out of time. So let's start with the discussions and see what uh, Peter says. As, okay, let me introduce our discussion. Uh, so Arnold, you can stop your sharing. Yeah. Okay, our discussion is Dr. Peter Copens is assistant professor of Islamic at the studies at the Faculty of Religion and Theology from the University Amster Amsterdam after studying Arabic language and culture at Katbaun University. He pursued his PhD in Islamic studies at Utrecht University with a dissertation on the concept of seeing God in Sufi commentaries. His research interests include the history of Quran commentaries, tafsir, and the history of Sufism. This current uh, research project deal with the Quran commentary of Jamal Din al Qasimi and the influence of the rise of the printing press on the genre of tafsir with NWO Veni. Thank you very much, Peter, for joining us. And please, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much for the invitation, first of all. And thank you very much, Arnold, for your enthousi enthusiastic uh, presentation. Um, <clears throat> I think very recently um, I submitted something to a journal that would probably qualify as uh, thick tafsir studies without realizing it or without having the language to uh, to say what um, what what I was actually doing, and it was an article that I had on the shelf for a couple of years actually, and I never really submitted it because I was kind of annoyed with the article, and. Um, and I, I think it, I think I was a bit annoyed with my own article because of some fundamental problems I had with uh, with the field of tafsir studies actually, and some doubts that I was having over the past years uh, since my dissertation. And um, but in the end, I submitted it exactly because I felt I could show some kind of paradigm shift with this approach. And I think this approach can be perhaps useful to detect paradigm shifts indeed in the history of the tradition. So my, yeah, um, my annoyance with my own article, it had to do with some uh, limitations I saw in my own methodology. And I would be very interested in um, discussing that with you and hearing your opinions about that. So first of all, a question I was really struggling with at that time is how representative is tafsir for intellectual history? And when I was starting my dissertation, I was very, very, very positive about that. Like, I really felt like, you know, tafsir, uh, it is really the, the window for any wealth unshowing in any time. And I was also in my introduction to my book, I was quite positive about this and also in an article I did. So when you take the tafsir tradition in a certain period, you can really find how people fought in that time, etc. And I've very often been wondering whether that's really true and how representative uh, the tafsir tradition actually is for intellectual history uh, in any era. And I would say it is a really slow tradition uh, and in that sense also a thick tradition perhaps. And <clears throat> so for example, I mean, recently we were in another conference on uh, Rasa'il literature uh, and I would say Rasa'il literature uh, is much more representative for the questions people are dealing with in a certain time, uh, for example. It's much more dynamic than the tif tafsir tradition. Uh, and also, I think we're often underestimating uh, how much tafsir is its own, um, has its own discursive tradition indeed, which is, which is sometimes very separate from other discussions that are going on. 
Uh, for example, when I wrote my dissertation on Ru'yatullah, I was also tracing all these things, uh, all these opinions on Ru'yatullah uh, in Tafsir. But at the same time, the Muhaddithun were having the discussion on Ru'yatullah, uh, and they were writing all these treatises uh, with hadith material on Ru'yatullah. So the consensus in, under Muhaddithun was, well, uh, the Prophet saw God with his own eye uh, during the Mi'raj. And they all built it on the Hadith tradition, while in the Tafsir tradition, a very different uh, discussion was uh, taking place with its own dynamics, etc. So I'm always wondering uh, how representative uh, the Tafsir tradition actually is. Um, I'm also reminded, I see Samuel is here, and I think Samuel, he made the same point actually in Amsterdam at a conference, where he also said like, there's this optimism among us scholars. Uh, well, if we want to know something about the relationship between Muslims and Christians, I mean, that's what Jane Damon McAuliffe did in a sense. We will just have to look at the Tafsir tradition and we can find out the history of this. Karen Bauer, uh, she wrote a brilliant book actually uh, on, uh, on gender relations, but she also had this idea, well, if I look at the Tafsir tradition, I can somehow reconstruct how gender relations changed through the ages. And I'm really wondering, and I mean, I'm in a sense undermining my own scholarship with this remark, but I'm really wondering whether, uh, whether we are right about this. So that's the first uh, issue. And then this approach of focusing on one first diachronically. I mean, that's what I've been doing for my entire career, I think. And I've also been wondering whether that's really the approach to follow and whether that also doesn't have its limitations. And if you want to have a thick approach to the Tafsir tradition, whether that also doesn't mean that focusing on one first is actually a very thin approach. Um, and I think that's something, I'm, I mean, that's something that worries me in my own scholarship. So, I mean, this article that I recently submitted that I talked about, I only focus on um, I only focus on one verse, and I also look at, I, I, don't, I think they were not 72, but at least more than 30 uh, commentaries. And at the same time, I was wondering if I really want to reconstruct this whole Ru'ya uh, discussion, is it really enough to take one verse? Because there's so many other verses uh, in the Quran that deal with the Ru'ya question that perhaps have a different approach, that have a different answer to the uh, I mean, in Surat al-A'raf, the Mufassir would probably be discussing it in a very different way than in Surat al-Majim. And I mean, once he started working on Surat al-Majim, perhaps he was five years ahead or 10 years ahead even. And perhaps the discussion gets a completely different dynamics already. Uh, so is it still a thick approach we're following when we only follow, uh, focus on one first? And I was thinking of the theodicy question that you use for this. Um, I would say the theodicy question is typically a question that pops up when you have a, an experience of contingency in your own life or when you are, I don't know, when the country or the city you're living in is, with, is struck with a plague or an earthquake or something. So it's a very urgent question from a spiritual care perspective, I would say. I mean, I heard you're a spiritual caregiver, so I thought I'll bring that in. So, I mean... I, I think the, the question of theodicy had really exploded in Europe after the earthquake of Lisbon, for example. And I mean, it's, it's, it's not something you will find in Midrash texts or something, I think. But I mean, it became a discussion between intellectuals and not only theologi the theologians, but also philosophers who were writing, I mean, Rasail in a way towards each other on this issue. And I would say, is the Tafsir tradition... Um, uh, quick enough to catch up all these discussions uh, that are really happening within society. Um, that's something I'm often wondering about myself. Um, oh yeah, and one more question, and I think then I'm out of time with my response that hopefully provokes a new discussion. This issue of periodization. Um, that's something that I've always been struggling with in everything I've written until now in the Tafsir tradition. Uh, and that's also something that I was always annoyed about in my own writings. So I, I just basically I projected uh, existing periodizations on my own uh, work and making classifications based on that. And I was wondering this thick approach to Tafsir, uh, whether that could somehow rescue us from these periodizations. And I saw 
in the slides you made that in a sense you're still projecting existing pre periodizations on what you are doing. So you have this idea of pre zamachery and post zamachery for example. And I was wondering whether this thick approach could perhaps find a way for us that we are not forcing these existing periodizations on our data, but that we use these data to come up with new periodizations and indeed uh, detect paradigm shifts from these data and from that build our periodizations. And uh, perhaps that's the way forward. But generally, I, yeah, I think what you're approaching or what you're proposing with this thick the, the future tradition, it can help us a lot with uh, deciding which way we should go with the future studies. But I think it should always somehow coexist within uh, within the future studies. And I think the balance perhaps should be uh, to use this thick the future studies to come up with some fancy and clever visualizations with which we then uh, decide to zoom in on very detailed questions. And I think so, perhaps we should find a good balance between the two and find a way how they can be uh, complementary. Thank you. Thank you very much for giving us a language to explain what we're actually doing. I think that's uh, really important. So thank, thank you. you very thank much. Thank you very much, Peter. So yes, please, uh, Arnold. You wanna, you have a comment now or are you gonna ask? Yeah, now for example, well, maybe is, Arnold should briefly respond and then you can stop the recording and we can. Yeah. yeah. Now, for example, to go into the, la uh, the first issue, yeah, like focus on one current verse. Uh, I first looked at different verses that said similar things and then, um, then I looked at where, in a sense, do I feel that, uh, because I looked at like five, six current verses that are all talking about uh, divine, you know, divine earthly punishment. And it was only at this Quran verse that people really were creative in a sense. All the other ones didn't. Also, a lot of the other verses only generated like small commentaries. Even in the larger works, they only like had a few sentences. While, uh, uh, you know, this verse, uh, you know, Surah 11, verse 117, generated in a sense a conversation. So these became sort of key verses that were, be, became the talk of the town within Tafsir. So in a sense, you had to in a sense you had to find where people were themselves seeing as these were school defining or thought defining verses, you know. So instead of expect expecting certain key verses to do that job for you, in a sense, sometimes you can be surprised where to find this. You have to look. I read, I ended up with focus on this Quran verse because I already looked at other Quran verse and I thought and I saw that this was the one where people started to be different. Even Al-Razi um, doesn't provide the same radical hermeneutic, uh, radical exegesis, at those similar other Quran verses. So in a sense, he's lazy at those Quran verses. And at this Quran verse, he, became, he had this really large creative moment in a sense. So also when it comes to uh, the idea of, so, but this is something I will say at the beginning, I don't know what would be good thick, her, thick approach a good fin approach in a sense you, you need to, in a sense yeah you need to show why this could be a thick or fin so this is something i still need to think about what is a good approach um and at the same time also it, it can in the end also like you said and what i try to see is that it can provide new categories new frames etc new typologies but also confirm the ones that exist so there is a pre and post samachari there is a pre and post Razi. I, at least on this Quran verse, you could see the switches. So that framing, that there is a sort of pre and post between this sort of trinity of Zamakhshari, Razi, Baidoi, it's true. There is a pre and post, uh, 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 you know, of this, of Zamakhshari, Razi, Baidoi. Uh, they prevent, they show the switch. You could even see it in non-Sunni tafsir. So before Zamakhshari, Razi, Baidoui, uh, the majority of uh, what I saw with Shi, Shi Tafsir, Ibadi Tafsir, they would use Wahidi as a sort of representation of sort of Sunni Tafsir or Tafsir of the other. And after Baidoui, they all started to use Baidoui. So that Baidoui became the, the central text of Sunni Tafsir. Other schools agreed on that. So that's interesting. You can see even 
that it, in a sense, infected also the, the others uh, from a Sunni perspective. At the same time, the other thing, in what way does Tafsir represent intellectual tradition? Um, what, like I said, um, the A reading and the B reading, and then even the small variants within A reading and B reading represented different the theologies. And I, I, in my larger research paper, and I still, I, pu I partially published that to, in Istanbul, you know, where we both were, uh, where I focused on the, in the Ottoman tradition, how this evolved in the Ottoman tradition. Um, the, um, uh, how do you say this best? Uh, um, the, you could see the development both within Kalam and within Fik, especially in Usul al Fik, um, what in a sense ended up in the Tafsir. So Al Razi started to, where, because that Quran verse started to represent the difference between Iman and Amal, between faith and works. So God doesn't punish people on earth for their unbelief. And there's, so for the kufr and shirk, he punishes them for violations in ethics. And then suddenly, suddenly Razi introduces, yeah, he, because they violate hukuk al ibad, but God forgives, is liberal in his hukuk Allah, in his rights when it comes to the correct creeds, tawheed, etc., worship. So he started to use that usul al fiqh language, the, the language of usul. When it comes to the hukuk, he started to use that in tafsir. So you see this direct, uh, the, the development in the other genres directly was used in tafsir. And of course, not every tafsir writer does that. Also, when it comes to um, sort of historical representation, um, you, for example, you have uh, Ibn al-Farisi. He, he has an Ahkam al-Quran work. Um, he was an Andalusian scholar. And he, uh, on you know, Surah Al-Tawbah, Surah 9, verse 29, the famous Jizya verse, he started to discuss there, he say, he, he's talking about the, re, the Reconquista. So he's talking about how the Northern Christians and the Franks and the, you know, the, the Catholics are invading Muslim lands within Spain. And he started to discuss, he mentions that, and then he started to discuss, how does this influence the Akt al zima so the, the, the treaty between, you know, with non-Muslims, within Muslim territories, within Spain. So, so there's this active action, actually, there's some, the, the, the time, concerns that were occurring this time. He discusses that in his Akram al Quran work. Kurtubi even. Arnold, Arnold versus how that involves. Arnold, Arnold I think there's, a, there's sometimes a problem with your microphone. And also, we are a bit uh, running out of time. So. Saying that we need to stop Arnold, we're a bit out of time. So I think it is better because there are a couple of, you know, we have a lot of questions to raise. So I thank you very much, Arnold. Thank you very much. Uh, 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 thank you very much, Arnold, for sharing your fascinating idea with us. Thank you so much, Peter, for your significant response to Arnold. Please do not forget our next talk on August 5th with Johanna when he, she hosts Walid Saleh on Tafsir and Royalty and will be responded by Scott Reed. Thank you very much and see you next week.